Hi, good afternoon, and thank you so much for joining us for another Tafana talk uh, for the Oris Diet. My name is Tatiana Casas Quinones, and I'm the manager of humanities and studio programs at Tafana. Today's Tafana talk is a part of the Tafana's artists and community series, which explores vital connections between the theater and our world. The theater the RSI was produced under the auspices of Tafana's Merle Debusky Studio Program, which is led by the director of the studio, Nidia Medina. Today's conversation will last about an hour and it'll have time for questions at the end. We're gonna have about 30 minutes of an open conversation and then we'll have time for your questions. If you have any, please submit them at the bottom of your screen in the chat function and we'll try to get to as many as possible. Let me introduce our panelists for today's talk. Ellen McLaughlin is the translator and adapter of the Oristaya. She's worked extensively both as an actor and as a playwright. Her plays have been produced off-Broadway, regionally and internationally, and she has taught playwriting at Barnard College since 1995. She is the recipient of the Writer's Award from the Willow Wallace, Lilla Wallace Reader's Digest Fund, as well as other honors, including the Susan Smith Blackburn Prize, the Helen Merrill, Award for Playwriting and grants from the NEA. Welcome, Ellen. Andrew Watkins is the director of the Oristaya. His work includes adaptations of literary classics, new plays, and devised per performances. He's worked as an associate and assistant director both nationally and internationally, including off-Broadway and here at Tifana. As a director, he is the recipient of a Puffin West Foundation grant for artistic creation related to social issues. Welcome, Andrew and Emily Greenwood would be moderating today's talk. She is John M. Musser's professor of classics at Yale University. Her books, including the forthcoming Black Classicisms and Expansion of the Western Classical Tradition, examine the ethics of literacy and historical interpretation in return to the questions, by whom and for whom were the classics written, by whom and for whom have they been interpreted, and in the view of which histories. In July, she will take a professorship at Princeton University. Professor Greenwood, thank you so much for joining us. And with that, I hand it over to you. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us today. Hello, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here with Ellen McLaughlin and with Andrew Watkins. Um, the purpose of our initial conversation is, is really just to reflect on the collaboration between playwright and director I wanted to, to start by giving both of you uh, an opportunity to, to talk about the, the genesis of this particular production. I was reminded looking at the screening yesterday of a quotation from the poet and novelist Dion Brand, who has written in her book, Map of a Door to No Return, history is already seated in the chair in the empty room when one arrives. And she said that it's one of the responsibilities of the artist uh, to sit in the room with history. Now in Aeschylus's Agamemnon, the first play of the trilogy, we get a very strong sense of the house, uh, the house of Atreus, the palace in Argos, and the way in which it's haunted. But Ellen, in your adaptation, you bring up very, very strongly, even more than the house, the sense of the individual rooms and their suffocation. And you have Clytemnestra talking about uh, the house as a reliquary. Uh, and then I was also struck by the, the arrangement and the, the staging, um, Andrew, and the, the use of screens to heighten that sense of rooms. And we're all watching this in our own rooms in uh, a moment when we have been constrained by our rooms in, in global lockdown. Uh, so I wanted to ask you both to take that tag of the idea of sitting in the room with history and to invite you first, Ellen, to talk about your restoring, your rewriting of Aeschylus's trilogy in the sense of sitting in the room with history. And then, Andrew, if you could tell us a bit about uh, this moment in history that inspired you uh, to, to want to produce Ellen's play. Um. Thanks, what an incredibly evocative image to, to start with. I, I think that notion of sitting in the room with history or coming into a room in which history is already sitting is, uh, it's the sense that one has as a human being when one enters out of the womb of the room, the room of the womb <laughs> into the world in which, um, history is sitting and the history takes many forms it takes the form of uh, what has happened to the world but it also takes the form of your parents whoever they happen to be 
and you spend a lot of time sitting in the, the you know dealing with that legacy which is part part of the explanation of who you are um which is some combination of your parents and i think that um playwrights all playwrights whether they want to deal with it or not have a familial relationship with the greek dramatists uh, the great tra tragedians and i've always felt that in my many now uh, adaptations that I've done, I'm communicating with a very distant past, but it's also an extraordinarily immediate past, the legacy of these, these great tragedians and who came up with the form that I've given my life to. Um, and it does have a parental quality to it um, they birthed the form that I've spent a lot of time with, but I also feel that it's an agonistic relationship as well. I, I'm in conversation with them. Um, I'm not merely serving them. Um, I'm taking the clay that they worked with and making my own uh, creation out of it um, with all due respect to what they did which is, you know, monumental and um, unapproachable to some extent. But um, so I've just spent a lot of time sort of grappling with that relationship. And it does feel very personal at this point. And Aeschylus, I mean, these are among the first plays that we have. Aeschylus feels somewhat more distant, at least at the beginning. Uh, from us because there is this kind of grandeur to this monumentality to the work. Uh, the poetry has this kind of icy glacial quality of being, you know, above and beyond. But the further I went into working with this play, the more I felt it's just heat and immediacy. And um, I came to really feel that this this play of all the plays, I wouldn't call it accessible, but I would say, you know, you can feel the heat of it in your hands as you work with it. Um, and this story in particular uh, has an immediacy and an urgency that I think we just never stop needing and needing an N-E-E-D, <laughs> but it's also with the K in my case. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I was, I was commissioned to write this in 2015, and I was in the midst of the first draft of it. No, I was, I was commissioned to, to write it in, in 2016. And I wrote the first draft of the first two acts over the summer of 2016 and then um, got to the, the final play, The Amenities, which I knew all along was going to be the hardest one to do. And that's when the election of Trump happened. And um, I just ran into a wall. And luckily, the um, Shakespeare Theater, Michael Kahn, the director, artistic director, and Drew Lechtenberg, who were the people that I was dealing with at, at Shakespeare Theater, were incredibly sympathetic and sort of sat with me and waited through my real struggle to come to terms with how I was going to finish this thing, how I was going to bring the this play, this very old play with this with with a very different solution to a different kind of ending. And it took a long time. Thank you. I will come back to many of those comments. Uh, I'd, I'd like now to hear, Andrew, your your version of what the urgency or the, the catalyst for wanting to produce this play was. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I had I had been interested in Oresteia for a very long time, and and I I'm actually so relieved to hear that Ellen struggled with the humanities too, because I was like I would read it and I 
and I would go, well, I really like it until we get to the humanities and it just stops speaking to me. Um, and, um, but, so, so I mean, when I, when I saw the production in DC, I was sort of just floored by, by what she had done with it. Um, but it, it really came to me in, um, it was last summer uh, and it was, I was in Minneapolis uh, as I, I, during the murder of George Floyd and I was at some of the early events and they just sort of collapsed. You know, you'd see peaceful protests with families um, in attendance and they would end with tear gas all over the place. And, and the next day or the, the following days you'd walk to the um, places where these protests are happening and just be burned down. And there's just a real sense of that there was, there's, there's something in the DNA of our culture that would not let anything else happen. This had to happen. And if we don't address what's in the DNA of our culture, this is going to keep happening. Um, and so, and so then I would, I thought, well, maybe the Greeks, maybe the Greeks are good now. And I had the memory of, of seeing this adaptation. So I reached out to Ellen and I was running a very informal read a play a week, just sort of get artists in a room together, just to sort of have some kind of community while we're all in lockdown. And this was the one, um, we all we sort of took a pause when that happened. And then this was the one we came back with. And uh, we, we had other readings. Um, we read uh, some things on prison abolition. We read some things about um, reparations, but everyone needed to stay up talking about this. Everyone who, who came to that reading and it was just get together, do a table read, very simple. And we just had to talk about it. Um, so that was when I went to Jeffrey at Tavon and I said, you know, you really should think about doing this. I know it's the worst time to propose anything, to make any kind of proposal for material, but if there's any way you can consider this play, you should consider it. Thank you um, for that very sort of uh, powerful reliving of the, the moment and context in, in which uh, you went to Aeschylus, went back to Aeschylus as Oristia. Um, I know as well that uh, there were further uh, very, very poignant resonances yesterday. Um, sometimes the Oristia is glossed as a trilogy about justice and uh, Ellen in your your version, you have phonetic wordplay on justice. You have Clytemnestra say that just this, her murder of Agamemnon is what she envisages as completing the circle, the cycle of revenge. We've had Claudia Rankine, we've had Amanda Gorman punning on justice and just us. Uh, and then yesterday we had this premiere of uh, Ellen Zorostaya directed by Andrew um, coinciding with the, the verdict uh, the sentencing verdict for Derek Chauvin. Could you speak a little bit more about that, Andrew? Um, yeah, I mean, I, and Ellen pointed out earlier today too, we've had some unusual happenings with this where, where this, this project was greenlit when, um, when you, we had Joe Biden sworn into office or when we, that that, and then today, just we didn't or yesterday we didn't even plan on it happening, but that was when um, the sentencing came out. So that there does seem something just sort of faded about that as well. Is that these dates are just aligning? Um, but I think that as far as the word justice goes, we see it used so many ways in the play, and the first time we hear it, it's not true justice. And I think the play does ask us in a very poignant way at the end to be, to think about justice and what can it mean? It doesn't really give us an answer as to what that is, but it also reminds us that very often we hear the word justice and it's doing nothing but mask, masking violence. And if you look at what people call justice and when that word is used, um, I think especially in this country, you, it's, you look at the actual action or what's been follow after it and it's nothing but violence. And, and so it, it's important, I think, that we, we start where we do in this play. We don't 
really get to the end of the, but we never really get to the end of the violence. We just sort of see the way people try to get through it. And at the end, we see people maybe make an attempt to move forward and try something different. Um, but a grave reminder that we need to be very cautious of the word um, as much as it is an important one. Uh, thank you for that. I mean, both of you in, in different ways have expressed uh, a sense of uh, frustration or difficulty with the third play in Aeschylus's Aristia, the Humanities, uh, and in particular the trial scene in which we have the Furies, the Arrhenius, as litigants, uh, and um, we have Orestes as the defendant, with Apollo as his uh, Sunegoros, his advocate, and then we have uh, a sort of second chorus who are Athenian, proto-Athenian jurors, and then we have Athena, the goddess, presiding over the trial. And there is something strained and artificial about that, and there are lots of slights of justice and procedure that I think are meant to be problematic for the Athenian theatre audience in its context. It's already a travesty of what justice looks like uh, for them. So, I mean, I, I love Ellen's innovation. I love uh, making the chorus, who are the help, who in the notes to the, the play are uh, meant to be a diverse and androgynous group of, of actors uh, who really stand in, and particularly for this digital version production, stand in for us as, as viewers at home uh, as a cross-section of, uh, of American society and who confront us very squarely with that problem uh, in ways that it's quite hard to, I think, achieve in contemporary adaptations of the Oresteia. Um, you know, this is our problem. Whose problem is this? Whose problem is Orestes? It's us. Uh, you know, do we sit it out? Do we blame the antagonists? Or do we accept that we are metaitios, we are co-opted, we are complicit? And I thought both the play and your directing of it, uh, Andrew, bring that out very, very powerfully. There was a sort of not just a leveling of the chorus members on screen and a, a distribution of responsibility, um, but uh, you know, it, it came home as a, a burden uh, for for me as a viewer, as a, an individual member of the audience too. So I found that very powerful. Um, Ellen, could I ask you to, to talk a little bit more about um, some of the, the sort of reversals uh, that, that structure Aeschylus's trilogy and, and how you uh, chose the ones that were most salient for you. There were these big, big structures of the unity of opposites uh, and um, you know, um, action rebounding in opposite action. Could you say a little bit more about how you approached your rewriting structurally? Well, I think if you if you take on the myth at all, you're um, even just the bones of it, as I sometimes do. I throw out an awful lot of stuff, but if you take on the myth at all, you're you're dealing with those opposites always. That the 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 love that the Greeks have of opposition, of, you know, sort of this system of contrast leading you to, um, well, it's also, it's the, the, the nature of dialogue, it's the nature of, you know, the agon. Um, so I didn't really worry about trying to incorporate all of those things. I thought that if you dealt with the myth, they were always going to be there, but the but sometimes they sort of rise to the surface and become very conscious and they are spoken of, you know, this notion of that Cassandra sees, she prophesies the, the murder of Agamemnon and she says, you know, Clytemnestra welcoming home her bully, victim, you know, lover, hated, you know, the, 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 the sense of the husband Agamemnon as being all things all opposites to her. Um, and that the idea that you end with is that Orestes is to some extent a victim of his own crime, that he is both the murderer and the victim of the murder. Um, as Clytemnestra says, you know, as she's dying, you'll never be free of me now. You know, you, 
you could have lived your life without being dominated by me, but now you will, you are your crime now. You'll never get away from me. But I think that those big building blocks that are just dramaturgical soundnesses in the Greeks, you never really have to worry about them because if you if you are telling the story even to the to the, on the most rudimentary level, as I sometimes do, the dramaturgy will take care of you. Um, and I think that those those contrasts that the the inability to reach a verdict that will satisfy everybody at the end is what the whole thing culminates in. And, and you know, in the Aeschylus, I should point out, I mean, we've been talking about how difficult the third play is, the Eumenides, but in the third play, the Aeschylus version, it's very clear that all of these things are very uh, live for them because it's a hung jury, you know, um, even though the Furies are the um, prosecuting attorney and Apollo, for God's sake, is the defense lawyer, even so a jury of human beings still finds the, the, the Furies argument compelling. And uh, it's a, so it's a hung jury, even in the Aeschylus. And, as loathsome as Apollo's argument is for modern audiences, you know, it's, it's astonishingly misogynist. It doesn't convince a human jury that is supposed to represent us in the Aeschylus. And Athena very early on says, this is too big a problem for me as a god to try to solve. I'm going to bring in a human jury and I will, you know, I will cast the deciding vote if it's a hung jury, but this is for you to determine. And that, that was just what I sort of took and ran with, you know, the, the idea that ultimately the gods can't help us in, 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 in formulating the basics of human justice. We have to figure this out without them. And yes, she does cast the deciding vote, but that's only because a human jury couldn't find um, a single uh, resolution. And it's, it was interesting because, of course, we were in the midst of, you know, the counting of the vote uh, in over <clears throat> a year ago when, uh, I mean, in November, when we did, I, I was talking about having the conversation with Jeffrey Horowitz where we decided how we were going to go ahead. And it was the Saturday when uh, Biden's victory was finally real, um, when it was finally decided. And we, there, that sense of being in a suspended uh, world where one way or the other of um, the movement towards justice um, would be either catastrophic or something else, you know, I mean, there is that sense of like living in this world where the scales are a little too evenly balanced. I, I mean, I am struck by your account of the writer's blog, which you experienced in the first instance with the uh, election of, of Donald Trump, um, and then the sort of uh, serial upsets or uncertainties <laughs> right down to uh, more recent history in the last election. And, you know, in a sense that reenacts the problematic of the Oresteia and every election, every law court case is a contest, is an agon in which one side wins and the other loses. But when the, the procedures are, are torn up or, or threatened to be thrown out, uh, then, you know, that is a sort of a potential crisis. Does one continue to write? Does one continue to, to, yeah. to advocate? That's slightly tumultuous. Can I, before I have one more question for Andrew, I just wanted to ask you because you alluded to Apollo's very controversial arguments from reproduction in that final scene in the Eumenides. 
And I saw you as writing back in a very powerful way in act one of your Oresteia, where you have Clytemnestra describing her sphere and scope of agency in terms of labor pangs and in terms of dilation or having to dilate sufficiently wide in order to accomplish or to birth the act of vengeance. And you know, there's metaphors of reproduction are there throughout the trilogy, but you developed it with a fresh audacity that I've never seen in a, an adaptation of the Oresteia. Well, thank you. Yeah, it had to be made wide enough for my great idea. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, she is an idiosyncratic mother, as Elector points out. <laughs> Um, the, the dream of the snake that she births the snake and this this difficulty of like this is my child you know what god is going to come to my aid in this situation it's, um who could love this ch child if not me and you could i ask um bit to you know, we were talking about ironies and reversals you had one of the chorus members, Chorus H, who had previously in the production played the role of Cassandra, I think is Nina Mendes, then become Chorus Member H, who ends up advocating for the right of the mother, Clytemnestra, in that final debate. Could you talk us through some of the decisions that were made, how you approach directing Act Three, uh, and you know, how the chorus uh, really um, fulfills that sort of crisis of, of deliberation and both diverge and dissent and yet at the same time come together. You mean just approaching it from like a technical directing perspective yeah. or? Um, I mean, I, it's, it's, it's where they, that they come apart, you know, they, they, the, the chorus in this um, text, they act as one unit through, through not all of it, but most of it, and not just um, just operating together, but textually and rhythmically, they 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 have a unity about them. Um, and even the ones who sort of like stray off or have a different opinion, sort of like flow back into it. And this is where they they just this is where they come apart, and this is where you sort of really see them. Um, have complete and whole points of view that oppose one another. Um, I mean, in many ways, it's just encouraging people to um, really argue, I think, like really go after one another. You know, there's, there's a kind of, um, there's a sense of like, oh, now we can sort of start speaking what we think. And the way that um, the fallout of that in the scene is it becomes dangerous for them. They start turning on themselves. And so really encouraging actors to, to find that trajectory, I think was important. Um, and I think if you get to a point where this feels, it's almost dangerous to vocalize your point of view, um, the act from, from um, Chorus G, who, who, who is the first one to wash Orestes, was the um, Orestes nurse, uh, feels a lot more radical. There's a much more, there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's another break in the action and the the silence there becomes much more uh, poignant, I think. So just technically, that's or just um, in a rehearsal room, that's how I would approach it. And and I think at that point, it's it's also tricky because the course has such a the course is a really hard part in this in this play because they have so much um, it's so much poetry to get through, and you're also developing really complete characters with not a lot. That and if you don't have a complete character at the end of that, uh, that ending I think loses some, some power. So there's a, so finding a way to develop having actors develop complete characters, and ways of just living in it with um, less stage time I think, or less sort of time where they're really alive in those characters individually. It's a challenge. I want to cue in our audience participants that we. Uh, are soon going to be uh, opening up discussion for, for questions. And I see a couple appearing in the chat. Uh, and to give everyone a, a chance to pose a few more questions, I'll just ask you, Andrew, one more directorial question about the, the lighting um, 
And you know, thinking about Greek tragedy, it's famously in the open air, in the sunlight, in the light of day. Uh, we had um, individual screens, uh, dark backgrounds. Um, in Aeschylus' Oristyle, you know, one of the image complexes is so much to do with the alternation of lightness and, and darkness. Could you talk a little bit about themes of, of light and darkness and how you approach them from a director's point of view? Yeah, I don't even know if that was what it, where my mind was going with that and, and the light and darkness. Um, the, I mean, a lot of it came from just a frustration to Zoom as a platform. You know, it's, it's the, the I, I don't know if everyone, every director would agree with me, but I think the, the biggest part of design is somehow mediating a relationship between the audience and the performers. And, and, you, and when you, you're doing something on Zoom like this, that that's a, you're essentially robbed of that. You're sort of told, told what, what that mediation is going to be. Um, so that was more than anything, I think me kind of trying to reclaim some kind of creative control over this, this platform. Uh, but the, I, the idea came from, from um, around a, a campfire, you know, people put a flashlight under their face when they're telling a ghost story. And, and, and this is in a way a, a kind of ghost story. And, and so that was the original idea or that's sort of where it came out of, um, of just like, we're, we're gonna be around a campfire telling this and, and then trying to get some kind of aesthetic unity. Um, it was also important to sort of have as little um, just visual noise as possible or just visual distraction as possible. So we all can really focus on listening to this because these Zoom screens get so um, chaotic with everyone in different um, areas with a lot of distraction going on. So minimizing that and making sure that we can really focus on on the, the text and the sound. Mm -hmm. And that was also important as well. Thank you. That that um, helps me to get a clearer sense of something that I found very effective, but having your your narrative, um, yeah, that explains it even more clearly. I also think it was very successful. I mean, Zoom is an incredibly um, tricky medium to create a sense of aesthetic unity where everybody the sense that we all inhabit the same space because we're all so very much not inhabiting the same space. And um, so to sort of uh, get rid of uh, the, yeah, as you say, the visual distraction, but also to make everybody equal on some level, um, which is really um, hard to do, but, um, and, and there's a kind of essentialism about the Greeks that, you don't want to be thinking about what they're wearing. You don't want to be thinking about, you know, um, the books behind them or, you know. So, yeah, I thought it was, uh, I thought it really worked <clears throat> as much as such a thing can work. So I think we should open up the conversation to more voices. Uh, we have some typed uh, comments in the chat. Um, and um, I could start by uh, reading out one from Tara Saunders. Um, the uh, you know, um, organizer should at any point just uh, interrupt if you want to cue in uh, live voices. Um, Tara Saunders says, the chemistry between these actors was phenomenal in capital letters. It would have been amazing on stage and the accomplishment was even more notable because of the limits and particularities of Zoom as Andrew, you've just spoken about. Can you talk a little bit about how you fostered and maintained this performance chemistry in this socially distanced format? Thank you for that question, Tara. Uh, well, we were, we were only helped by, like, a lot of these cast members have done this on stage and they, they did it together as a company. And so they knew each other and were able to come in with, with some of that. So that that's that's just a benefit. Um, and then and then the rest of it, I, I I really think you these are extraordinary performers, and they're very very present, and they're very present people, and they're able to to make that happen. I don't know if there's anything I can do as a director to 
make that except to sort of in my process give them space to explore that with one another and be talking with one another and be active with the material with one another so i i think encouraging as much conversation within the process as possible is important to achieve something like that or achieve some kind of version of a company um and um the one of the chorus members who played chorus a rindy is Ellen's husband. So there's immediately a chemistry with the, the text there. So that that was helpful. Um, you know, I think we just got really lucky with the cast. So I have to say about that. So I think we are actually going to switch to asking everyone who's posting in the chat to pose the questions in their own voice. So uh, watch out, you're going to be queued in. I think, uh, Morgan, can we hear your question, please? Oh, okay. Um, I, in the body of Ellen's work, I, f I find that there's always this digging deep into finding a resonant necessity, contemporary necessity with the original, like the necessity of the Trojan women with the situation with women in Bosnia, for example. And I would love to hear a little bit more of that because, you know, there's so much discussion of why do we still do the Greeks? You know, that comes up a lot. And so in terms of the necessity of this, and I think we touched on it a little, the necessity of exploring justice and re-exploring justice, and that's a constant need for re-exploration. So, yeah, I, I, I guess I'd, I'd like Ellen to talk a little bit about how she approaches a lot of this? Hi, Morgan. Um, one can only write out of one's time. Um, and I think that if you want to address your time and whether you want to address it or not, you are to some extent always addressing it if you, in, in the writing, in the present tense. But I do that said, um, and if there are things that I feel that I can only approach correctly, but with the use on some level of a Greek, a Greek play as a model, or a, a structure on which I can lay um, whatever my concerns are, whatever my work is. Um, and I think that that's part of the reason that they are so, um, they're so enduring. Uh, they really, but one of the reasons that I think they're so helpful is that um, they're so old um, and that the religion that is practiced in the plays is not practiced by anybody now and um, hasn't been for quite some time and i think that also they are so old and there's so much a part of our culture western culture that, that there is a way in which they don't belong to anyone um which makes them different from any plays that i know any other plays that i know well certainly because i think there are other plays from other ancient cultures, but I don't know them the way that I know the Greeks. So I feel that um, the Oristia ended up being a way that I could grapple with um, the movement from the Obama era into the Trump era and the sense of outrage and dread that that um, brought into the world. And also it gave me a way to talk about not only justice, but the fragility of democracy, which I think is unfortunately an issue that uh, has never been more lively in my lifetime. Um, because the Greeks were always concerned with the fragility of democracy because their democracy was extremely fragile, you know, threatened from without and from within. And the, and the playwrights were always I mean, Aeschylus less than um, Sophocles and Euripides, 
but they're always engaged in the fragility, the vulnerability of the of, of democracy and all of the questions that that brings. And Euripides, of course, was always warning people that we could lose democracy. And in fact, we did, you know, they did. Uh, he was right. It didn't last. Uh, so I find them poignant and meaningful in a way that, you know, as a civilization, they, they um, were really grappling on the deepest level with the biggest questions, and they're the questions that continue to be terribly significant for us. But thank you. Thanks, Morgan. Well, in that context, thank you very much for that question. Today I was reading about a project um, fronted by some literature professors at the University of Tübingen in Germany called the Cassandra Project, which I understand has now wrapped up, but was a collaboration with the German military using uh, literary studies and literature as an early warning system for future wars and political crises. So taking soundings, say, from Azerbaijan literature or um, Algerian literature to try and get a sense of what the next conflicts were likely to be. And I know for Ellen, I mean, that will sound a little bit absurd. Uh, literature as an early warning system. Uh, it's a very, very, very early warning system. And as the chorus... Right say in Aeschylus's Agamemnon, uh, and as Ellen has in her version as well, you know, we learn unwillingly through suffering, uh, you know, ignoring all of the early warning systems and politicians <laughs> are unwilling to learn uh, again and again. Um, wow. Yeah, that's for me definitely part of the, the urgency uh, and why we keep going back to the Greeks, the double vision of tragedy that enables us to keep time with a, a vanished distant past uh, that also gives us some distance from uh, our very contemporary present. Um, I would like to uh, read a question from James. James has advised us that his sound is not great. This is a question from James Townsend. Um, could you discuss the decision to eliminate the figure of Aegisthus from the play? His presence in Aeschylus helps underline the generational curse that stains the whole house. So his uh, father Thyestes and uh, Atreus's murder of his brothers, uh, making his father Thyestes eat his brothers. The generational curse that stains the whole house, but it might also be seen as undercutting Clytemnestra's agency, which is so powerful in this version. Thank you, James. Yes, thanks, James. Hi. Um, yeah, I, I mean, the latter is true for me, that just this uh, muddies the water in uninteresting ways for me. So I've always cut him out of every time I've taken on this myth. Um, because he, I, I feel that Clytemnestra's motive, her, you know, laser-like, uh, intention doesn't need help um, as soon as Iphigenia is sacrificed as she is sacrificed. I just don't feel like I need, uh, I, I don't want her to be doing it on behalf of or with the help of any male. Um, and I find Clytemnestra a, a singular figure. For me, she, she just resonates that way. And it just, this is, you know, he's a bad guy. And he's not psychologically complex for me in the way that uh, Clytemnestra just is uh, wondrously complex. So I always cut just this out. Because <laughs> it, it just uh, the, the idea that she has an affair with, um, you know, you know, the with the just it's just it doesn't matter to me. So I, I've always cut him out. But yeah, he does. He he does act as, you know, his father's son and the representative of, of the wronged family. You know, but I think for a, a modern audience, that aspect of the the myth is not so resonant. It would be tremendously resonant for pe people in the classical audiences because they knew the myth much better than we do. 
but thanks. So we have um, a question from uh, Nancy, who I understand is going to appear on the screen. <laughs> Thank you so much for your wonderful discussions and perspectives. I have not seen the play yet. I am so sorry. But my question is about the chorus. I've always viewed the chorus as an informed group of citizens. But how do you, Ellen, um, what's your conception of the role of the chorus? Are they disinterested citizens? concerned citizens? How did you approach the chorus? Well, I had a, thanks Nancy. I, the, 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 the project that I had set in front of me was that I needed to turn the three plays into one play one evening. So the chorus had to be consistent throughout. And um, in the Aeschylus, the chorus are three very, very different groups of characters. The first chorus in Agamemnon are basically the old guards, the the older men who are left behind when Agamemnon goes off to war, and so they're allied with Agamemnon with the with the patriarchy. In the second play, the libation bearers, they are captive women um, who uh, nevertheless ally themselves with the, with Electra and Orestes. And in the third play, in this shocking innovation on Aeschylus's part, the chorus are the Furies. So they are not disinterested citizens. They are not citizens at all. They are primordial beings um, who end up being the prosecuting attorney um, in the trial, which must have been, I mean, there are all these apocryphal stories about how terrifying the Furies were in the first production, um, but they must have been pretty scary. And one of the things that Michael said to me, Michael Kahn said to me was, um, you have to make it one evening. It has to be a, a short, uh, short-ish, uh, you know, ordinary length evening. So two, two and a half hours or so. And you have to include the Iphigenia material so that we know the, the linking material, what, what um, makes Clytemnestra do what she does. And the Furies have to be terrifying because they never are, you know, in most productions, they are people in monster outfits, women in monster outfits, and they're not convincing and they're not scary. And I thought, well, what would it be like when Trump comes to trial? if one of the people in the jury was a woman who had worked in one of his hotels and whom he had never noticed, but who had always known and always seen what happened, what he did, who he was. And what if the fate, you know, his fate was uh, to be decided by someone he'd never taken any account of? And I thought that would be scary. And it would certainly be scary to Orestes if suddenly the people who had his fate in their hands were people who had seen everything and who had always known him and had always been part of his household. And so I thought really what you want is people who are of the household, the household help who are unremarkable, they don't have names. The principal characters barely know who they are. I mean, Electra comes out of the chorus, so, but she's still not part of the chorus. I mean, even though she has taken upon herself that role, she's still not really, you know, she is not of them, she's of the house. So that was my solution to the problem of what to do with the chorus, but the, you're right, Nancy, that any dramatist who's going to take on the Greek plays, the big question you always have to answer, and I've answered it in many different ways and various adaptations, is what do you do with the chorus? Who are the chorus? What is their function in this play? Sometimes they're sort of uh, our representatives, and sometimes they're not. You know, sometimes 
like in the Persians, they're really not us. But to some extent, they're always a means by which we are interpreting and reacting to the actions of the principal characters. And I think that's true here too. I think that's um, another example of, you know, how as a playwright, you don't come empty handed to the exchange or the transaction of, of adaptation or, or rewriting. And that's a, a choice that is, um, makes very, very powerful sense in terms of the disenfranchised in the history of American democracy, but is also convergent with the sense of the disenfranchised explored in so many choruses of the Greek tragedies that survive, chorus played by actors who are citizens, regular citizens, uh, and then playing, uh, imagining themselves as the other. Um, internal yeah. outsiders. Um, I, I found that very, very powerful as a choice too. Um, so I don't see any uh, other immediate um, questions in the chat. Um, I think maybe I sort of will ask um, you both to reflect on a line that a lecture speaks, I think in act two, uh, Ellen, um, in your Oristaya, where she has the line, this emergency into which I was born. And many commentators on the Oristaya see justice, the justice that Aeschylus is exploring in terms of a, a cosmic level as well, and the reciprocity between all things in the cosmos. And I was thinking not just about racial justice, not just the contemporary crises of our politics, uh, but also uh, environmental justice and particularly um, youth headed uh, environmental campaign groups uh, who feel as though they are born into a very, very present emergency. Could, could I ask you both to reflect uh, on that sense of justice and, and the cosmos? Uh, that is there in this play as well. Um, I'll just, the, the, the Electra says in the emergency, which has been my life, in the emergency, there has been no, and then she talks about the sense that she hasn't had time. She hasn't had the ability during the emergency, which has been her life, to take in the color of the sky to take in joy, to experience the ordinary pleasures of human life. And that she is now sitting, because she's been tending the furnace, the furnace of, you know, the, 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 of vengeance, basically. And now she's sitting in the ruins of the furnace of vengeance blew up and she's sitting in the ruins of it. And I think that, I mean, I feel that many children of all eras feel that they were born into an emergency. They were born into an untenable world, a world of crisis, a world which needed them to try to fix it, the unfixable world. And I think, you know, my childhood, we spent a fair amount of time under our desks thinking that we were going to be, you know, annihilated in a nuclear holocaust. Um, and I, I'd be interested, Andrew, I mean, do you feel that, did you feel as a child that you were born into an emergency of a different kind? I mean, the, I mean, the climate emergency is the big one for my generation. Um, so yes, absolutely. Uh, I mean, that, that's my favorite speech in the whole play and it's, it's a tough race. Um, and this, just like the feeling in the, uh, I mean, I don't have a lot to, to add to what Ellen said, but Electra, you know, Electra has been compelled to do this thing and to nurse 
a furnace inside of you to nurse this anger inside of you and to not let that go and to not let it go. And then finally this thing, you do this thing that you are nursing this furnace for and there it is and you're looking around and here's this destruction and your brother is collapsed in nightmares because of it and you're covered in blood. And the feeling of now what? What have I given my life to? Like, what have I missed? And, you know, I, I didn't go dancing. I didn't see the blue of the sky. I saw a furnace. Um, and to, to have the, the internal feeling of emergency, to be born with the internal feeling of emergency, the, the constriction of that, the fear of that, the anxiety of that, it's a very powerful word to give to someone's childhood emotional experience that leads to murder. Um, it, it's an amazing, it's an amazing start of the third act. Uh, and I think Rad delivers it incredibly on this recording. Um, and, and another, a, a huge, a huge, and I, and, I, and I feel like Ellen kind of disagrees with my take on this, but um, I, I, a huge lens for me in this would be, would be family intergenerational trauma and how someone is, can be just born um, traumatized and they can be born with a physiological response that immediately puts you into a sense of danger. And, and there's, there's something, I think there's something there in the way we can understand fate and this curse nowadays now that that kind of language has entered the mainstream. Um, and, and that's partly what happens to someone who's, who's traumatized is they're stuck, they're stuck in the past, but they're living in the present and they can't imagine a future. And, and for the past and the present to always be in your body and you're always at a state of, you're always ready to go back to that state of emergency. You know, that's what happens to a traumatized body. And so it's a very, amazing um, description, I think, of, of that experience as well. Um, yeah, I'm so glad you pulled that, that, um, that speech because it's, it's my favorite. I think also it's what I'm trying to get at at the end, this, this dream, I can't wake up from it. I, I can't, I'll, I can't, I can't, I'll never wake up from this dream. And I think that, that that's what you're talking about, Andrew, that's that sense of the, the loop of trauma that you you're continually pulled back into the past, which is the present, which is the pre past, which is the present. And I think that that's uh, an aspect of the play that's really vital and also an aspect of the Aeschylus version of the play. The past is not past. The, and there is a line in the Aeschylus that the dead are always killing the living here the dead are to blame and then but it's only the living who are here you know what do we do with them um but that sense of there's no we can't wake up from this terrible nightmare and, yeah and and the, the need to find language to articulate devastating experiences it's it's, it's part of um it's part of the healing process and to to and the chorus start to attempt that in the end, I feel like. We start to attempt to try to find something. Um, and I think the other thing that was a huge clue for me in the, in the for especially for the, 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 the brother and sister for Orestes and Electra is that we have two mentions of ritual in the play. And one is um, Clytemnestra has devised a ritual which kills Agamemnon and you have Orestes and Electra who improvise a ritual wishing for the death of their mother. And so not only do we have the need to create rituals, these are people who haven't inherited rituals, they don't have a memory of ritual, but their rituals they come up with kill. And, and, and you see maybe perhaps, hopefully at the end of the third act, the development of a ritual that does something different um, but but they're, they're people without a, 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 a sense of, a, I feel like some kind of cultural necessity, the cultural necessity of ritual is missing from their heritage or 
what they've inherited and what they've inherited is, is, is violence and trauma. And they're trying to cope with that. They're trying to figure out where to go with that. Yeah, that's good, Andrew, because I, I think I, that at the top of the second act, I'm talking about the, the rituals of, you know, making the beds, wiping the counters, all of the rituals of the life of household servants, which are not serving them. They, they, they are ways of passing time, but they're, because you have to continue to do them over and over again, there is this circular looped quality to, it doesn't, time doesn't progress because we're doing the same things, these meaningless um, rituals, which are just habitual nothingnesses, you know. Um, so I think that that notion of they are a household without meaningful, without useful rituals is great. I never really thought about it. And that the, what every ritual, that, the only ritual that is devised over the course of the play that actually does something or does it is the final ritual of washing yeah. the hands. And that, that you know, is a major problematic for Aeschylus, ritual repetition and the drama is occurring within a ritual festival. And it rehearses this problem of ritual that endlessly repeats without changing. And I think it takes us right back to Andrew's question at the beginning, his observation on justice. Uh, you know, let's not make of justice itself an endlessly repeating ritual that is no longer serving the ends and ideals which we want it to, or let's not make of democracy, as you warned us, Ellen, thinking about the fragility of democracy, let's not make of uh, democracy uh, a ritual. I'm going to give the last question to Laura Slatkin, who's asked in the chat. Um, Thinking of the furnace inside you, was the richness of Aeschylean metaphor particularly generative for you, uh, for you, Ellen, and then also for you, Andrew, as a director? Uh, it's sublime poetry, the Aeschylus. And I, I have to remind everybody that I don't read Greek, so I'm reliant on all the translations that I work from. So. I'm getting a, an approximation of what people like you, Emily, um, really know, uh, which is what the what the Greek feels like, sounds like, is, you know. But the poetry, um, the images that come up over and over again, the sense of the the net that she throws over him, the sense of being caught inside nets, the sense of how blood works as a, I mean, there is something like, you probably know it um, as I do not at the moment, but there, that thing that Clytemnestra says after the murder, uh, uh, where she says, uh, in my place, she says, I bathed in his blood like a summer rain, flowers opening after a drought of years, you know. There is something along those lines in the Aeschylus. I mean, I'm just sort of riffing on it, right? But that one after another, there are images that I could take and make my own. And um, that was, it was this wonderful sort of high arced room to walk through and um, play around in. And there's the great satisfaction and relief in knowing that I can't hurt Aeschylus. He's always going to you know, he'll last forever and he'll last in the Greek, uh, but that I can, you know, improvise in relationship with him is very, it's, a, it's an amazing, it's a great privilege. Mm -hmm. I, I, you know, I would just say, Ellen, that, you know, uh, native, uh, ancient Greek is no one's native language and so it's enormously refreshing for me when I think of for example the verbal ironies in Aeschylus's Greek which although I might read I'm always translating but to read your play and you know just to give an example of, of one of the the many many uh, verbal ironies that that you originate um, when Agamemnon says that he uh, 
would do anything for her, for Iphigenia, and Clytemnestra rejoins, yes, you were capable of anything, and later the chorus reflects, we thought you were a man who was capable of anything. I mean, that has an immediacy uh, and an at-home directness that I can never get from Aeschylus. Oh, that's great to hear, thank you. And I guess I can say off that is I, you know, I, I read, I don't know how many translations of the Oresteia while I was preparing to do this. And eventually I had to stop because none of them were helpful. It just, it wasn't, th this is a new play. This is very much a new text crafted for a moment. And the, the more I, as, as someone thinking, oh, I have to somehow give life to this, was spending time on like, oh, what are the changes from the, from Aeschylus? The less connected I felt to this play, and less connected to how this play impacts us now. So, um, I don't know if I can answer that question. I just, for me, I had to sort of leave that behind and say, I'm actually not doing Aeschylus. I'm, I'm doing Ellen McLaughlin, and that this new new play deserves that kind of attention. Thanks. I mean, one of the things that I need to point out is that in the process of developing the play, I would bring drafts to Michael Kahn um, over the course of the years that I worked on it. And he kept on saying, you don't seem to understand. I actually trust you. I want you to make this your own. This is not supposed to be some dutiful classical response, you know. This is your play. I'm I am producing your play. Your name is going to be over the title. It's not going to be Aeschylus over the title. Just do that thing you do. That's why I, you know, um, asked you to. And he kept on saying, move further from the source in order to make it your own. So there's a way in which I owe Michael this great debt because I could have written a rather dutiful um the version that would be closer to the source, but it wouldn't have felt like mine as much. And um, so I'm very grateful to him for that. Thank you. Um, thank you both for your generosity in talking about your collaboration over Ellen's play. Uh, thank you for fielding our questions. Thank you to the participants for questions and, and comments. And thank you as well to uh, subscribers and donors to Theatre for a New Audience. Um, we're going to call it for a close uh, today, but I, I've really enjoyed uh, hearing from Ellen and Andrew. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Emily. Thank you, Emily.